Welcome to the Cross-Cultural Psych Podcast with Professor Paul Youngman Kim. This podcast features conversations on the intersection of psychology, culture, and faith with renowned scholars in psychology and related fields. And now, here is Dr. Paul Youngman Kim. Brittany, thank you again for being here to talk to me about teaching, faith integration, and DEI integration. You know, at Christian Higher Education, we talk a lot about faith integration, and I was curious to hear your perspectives on what that looks like for you. Is that even the right terminology to call it faith integration when it comes to teaching psychology at a Christian higher education institution? Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Just for like, you know, kind of introducing this dialogue, I'm really excited to chat with you about it. I think for me, faith integration has really evolved in my understanding of it being at a Christian higher institution. And at first, I would say I had this idea that faith integration was kind of like sprinkling like a Bible verse on top of what I was teaching in Gen Psych or trying to make some of those maybe kind of like more surface level connections. And as I've developed in my scholarship and also my teaching, I think faith integration has started to be more about like a back and forth dialogue to really understand what psychology has to offer theology as much as what theology has to offer psychology. And so for me, that's where it starts to get really interesting and really dynamic is to say this isn't a one directional thing. It isn't just that as a psychologist, I can bring in some pieces of theology or faith to my classroom, but really to say, what does it look like to meaningfully be engaging with theologians and theology to try to show what they're thinking about and what they've been thinking about, to be honest, for a lot longer than we've been talking about psychology, how that informs the human experience, but also then how what we know from a psychological perspective, and especially from a research methods perspective, can be really valuable in a Christian setting, whether that's an institution or like a church-based setting. So I love the idea of faith integration. I'm really thankful that we get to do it at SPU. I think that's a really unique aspect of our jobs. And it's something that allows me to be really authentic in my classroom because I can talk openly about the questions I'm wrestling with. And a lot of times that is, how is my faith shaping my science? And how is my science shaping my faith? Yeah. Hmm. I love the fact that you talked about how psychological science can also inform our faith. Like when I taught Gen Psych, I was sprinkling in Bible verses to explain Mm -hmm. conformity to norms, right? Or thinking about how attitudes might influence behavior, but that psychological sciences can also inform and deepen our Christianity as well. I'm curious, can you think of an example where either psychological science affecting your faith or faith affecting psychological science that you're you're willing to share? Yeah. Yeah, I I love this question. It's actually the question I wanted to ask somebody yeah. else on your podcast because I think it's so interesting to hear how as scientists that's informing our faith. For me, I think the biggest piece of that is that psychologists and theologians both really care about human flourishing, human well-being. And I think that there are a lot of ways that theologians have focused on the intention and not the impact. And psychologists can focus on the impact. And so I love marrying those two together to say, okay, here's the intention, here's the Christian value. How do we look at that from a scientific perspective and see are we affecting people Mm. in the ways that we intend, in the ways that we believe are consistent with God's purpose and hope for, for us? And so for me, that that takes lots of different shapes, I guess, but one of the most concrete examples of how my own faith has been shaped yep. by my science is related to human sexuality and how we think about the ways that we communicate human sexuality and also the ways that we think about the impact of those messages mm-hmm. that we're sending mm-hmm. and whether those messages are life-giving mm-hmm. and consistent with what I believe Jesus is calling us to, like a, an abundant life, or if those messages that we're sending are maybe having an impact that is inconsistent with that hope for flourishing and an abundant Mm. life. Wow, that's really powerful. And because you've taught several different types of psychology classes, I'm curious, Mm -hmm. is faith integration easier in some classes versus others? And how so? 
Yeah, it definitely is. Or at least it has been for me in classes like general psychology and social psychology. I feel like the faith integration piece comes quite naturally, especially the more I engage with these topics in my own kind of research space. And I'm thinking about them from like a faith perspective and a DEI perspective. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to teaching things like research methods or advanced research methods, I find it a lot harder to integrate faith in a way that feels organic rather than forced. And that's where I find myself kind of falling back on the sprinkling things here Mm -hmm. and there. Mm -hmm. And so in those classes where I don't necessarily see the connections as clearly, I think my faith integration does look a lot different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more about trying to communicate the topics that we're researching Mm -hmm. being related to my faith perspective Mm -hmm. and why I think they're important. And so in my advanced research methods classes, we study dehumanization and how to reduce the dehumanization of individuals experiencing homelessness. And so I try to tie that concept to a call to love our neighbors and to be caring well for other people Mm -hmm. and also to be seeing God's image in all of God's creation. And so there conceptually, I think some of it comes up, but when we're like working through like the logistics of a regression or something like that, it it just doesn't feel like it fits as well. And I think depending on what types of topics you're researching, Mm -hmm. some of those connections might feel a lot more fluid and others of those connections might feel really, really hard to, to make. And so then I also am trying to just kind of step back and say, what else can I do to show up for my students in a way that communicates God's love for them? And then I think that layer of faith integration takes kind of a more pastoral care type of flavor, I guess, where I'm trying to check in with my students and, you know, I take prayer requests from them anonymously and praying for them. So there are maybe levels or layers with which you could integrate faith. And some of those feel authentic in certain spaces and some of those feel really disingenuous in spaces. And so I'm always trying to figure out what feels authentic for me Mm -hmm. too. Mm Yeah, I like the fact that you brought up advanced research method, because as you know, that's something that we in the (laughs) department all teach. And similar to what you shared, I also struggle with how do I integrate Christian faith into a advanced research method class? And Mm -hmm. like you, I think I sort of, because I think about it more, I'm more intentional about how I come across to students, right? Sort of that pastoral aspect and even checking in much more intentionally in that class about how students are doing. And then similarly to what you described, my students, they tend to look at like religious related variables in their Mm -hmm. research proposals. So like religious coping or religious commitment is another way that students can sort of dive into that literature, right? But it is hard, but it requires a lot of creativity because it's so hard. Yeah, absolutely. I feel for our colleagues who work with non-human animals and thinking through maybe how to make some of those connections. And so I think when you're studying topics that are a little bit more closely related to Mm -hmm. faith-based measures or kind of faith-based outcomes, that's really helpful. And it could be really, really hard in a neuroscience class, or if you're doing operant conditioning with rats or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned gen psych. And I have, prior to you joining us at SPU, I have experience in teaching gen psych as well. And I know how challenging it is because it's such a broad area in psychology, right? No one is trained as a generalist in psychology. And so I know that you do a fantastic job of teaching our general psych students. I'm curious if there's an example of what faith integration might look like So as an assignment or as a lecture activity, something like that, where it allows students to intentionally see or or examine things from a Christian perspective. Yeah, this is a great question. And Mm -hmm. I tried to do it, I suppose, in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of my main goals in Gen Psych is to get students thinking about the possibility Mm -hmm. that faith and science can be in dialogue. Mm because not all of our students are Christian and not all of our students prescribe to a faith of any sort. A lot of our students are really wrestling with 
whether or not they want to be associated with a faith. And for those who are coming out of either really conservative faith-based backgrounds or haven't really been exposed to faith at all, mm -hmm. I think both groups of folks feel like faith and science are across like a huge chasm, like a divide that cannot be kind of bridged. And that's honestly like where my faith perspective started in terms of like my faith dialogue with science was you can be a Christian or yeah. you can be a scientist, but you can't be both. And the minute you start kind of moving over to the dark side of science, it's pretty much like a death sentence yeah. for your faith is kind of the perspective that I was given. And so some of the first lectures I give related to this is a, a phrase that I've communicated to my students that turns up in my student evaluations all the time is this idea that God is not threatened by science and trying to help students think through like the possibility that the tools that we use as scientists can bring us closer to mm -hmm. God and also into deeper understanding of God's creation and how to care for his creation well. And so I think at the ground level, that's my goal in gen psych is mm -hmm. just to start opening the door for a conversation mm -hmm. that these two things can be mutually informative and you don't have to choose like mm -hmm. you don't have to choose to be either a christian or a scientist and then part of that that really kind of naturally comes out in gen psych is getting to share a little bit about my own faith journey and those struggles i have had where i felt like faith and science were kind of at polar opposite ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. and helping students see then how my faith has evolved. And I honestly believe strengthened because of the science that I do. And because of the questions I get to ask as like a social psychological researcher. And so that, that comes out in our lectures quite a lot. I think the other piece that comes out from a lecture perspective mm -hmm. is that really you can't talk about like health and human flourishing without talking about religion and spirituality on some levels, because it's the part of the human experience. And we need to talk about both like the protective factors that come from that yeah. as well as the risk factors. And so I try really hard to present a balanced perspective mm -hmm. in my class mm -hmm. that religion <laughs> has been beneficial and harmful in lots of ways. And that's where that impact piece comes to mind for me is always trying to hold the Christian values up mm -hmm. to the impact of what we are seeing in terms of how different Christian practices or beliefs affect human flourishing and well-being. Yeah. And I think that's a question that theologians, pastors, and psychologists all really care about. I find that in yeah. interdisciplinary conversations, that's a space where we can really meet and say, okay, we agree on these things. We agree that like mm -hmm. human flourishing is really important. We believe that loving one another is really important. Right. And so that kind of seems to be our common ground. I feel like that balance between on one hand, pointing to how religion can do real harm, right? Mm -hmm. And also, on the other hand, there's also evidence of religion helping to facilitate well-being. Mm -hmm. I think that balance is so important. And sometimes, mm -hmm. especially in this generation of students, especially in how they process diversity topics, mm -hmm. they sort of automatically equate Christianity or Christian faith with, oh, that means that like we have to kind of disconnect that Christian faith with psychological science, right? That yeah. religion is all about the harmful effect and they don't really focus on like maybe the facilitative aspect. So I mm -hmm. appreciate the balance that you're talking about, Brittany. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's a hard one to communicate, I think, especially when you recognize that everybody comes to your class yeah. with a really deep set of experiences mm -hmm. and and so trying to to navigate where that can be beneficial and harmful is yeah I think difficult, but I found, and this kind of connects to a question I've been spending a mm -hmm. little time thinking about since you had sent around some of these questions is yeah. just thinking through like 
how do we chat with students when they feel kind of jaded about faith mm -hmm. or when they feel like I've been there, I've done that, and this yeah. doesn't serve me or it doesn't serve the DEI efforts that I care really passionately about. And I find presenting a balanced perspective, I think unarms or disarms people mm -hmm. in a really interesting way yeah. because you're not trying to present like a one-sided view of like, this is all good all the time and there's never been any harm that's come with it. Right. I think that where students can see you acknowledge mm -hmm. that there has been harm, that there has been wrongdoing, that we have inflated Christianity and white nationalism for a very, very long time. When you can name that and call it out, I think it's actually really refreshing for students. And I know I can speak for myself. I'm taking seminary classes right now, mm -hmm. and I'm so thankful for the professors at SPU that are teaching a very different type of theology than the one that I had ever been exposed to growing up. And in naming the ways that Christianity has been kind of co-opted by race and capitalism and all of these other ideologies has been really freeing, I think, to allow me to say, actually, maybe this isn't something I need to reject. Maybe this is something I can continue to embrace and to feel like there's the option to separate those things out and say, here's yeah. what is valuable for me. Here's the faith pieces that are valuable. Mm -hmm. And here's the way that that has been like contorted mm -hmm. to serve a particular people group, to serve a particular gain, to serve a particular power that I don't want anything to do with as much as I can try to separate myself from that. And before that never felt like an option. And so the theologians and the seminarians that I've had a chance to take classes from here at SPU are so fantastic. And mm. they do a really great job of just saying, we're going to lay it on the line. We're not going to pretend this is all rosy, but there's, there is a lot of truth here. There's a lot of goodness here. Mm. So let's try to kind of unearth what is worth saving right. <laughs> and what was maybe never intended at all. Yeah, what a blessing it would be for students to hear from you about that experience of relearning, right, and reflecting on your own faith. So thank you for yeah. talking about that. I also think that I'm sure you do something similar, but on the first day of my cross-cultural psychology class, I send a survey out about how important is faith integration in this class, right, to mm -hmm. you. To you as a person or as a student, how important is faith integration? And over the years, more and more have been saying it's not as important or not at all important. Used mm -hmm. to be that more said really important or moderately important, but now the skew is kind of the other way. Initially, I was really discouraged by that, but yeah. I think I'm trying to empathize with like why it is that they're coming into my classroom with that perspective, right? Like what sociocultural factors, what yeah. experiences have shaped that and almost think of it as a challenge then to help them see hey, there are other ways to think about Christian faith and these topics, right? For example, what you heard in your church setting or Sunday school yeah. setting only. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's such a good idea. And it makes me so curious, Paul, do you ask them about other things like how important is social justice integration to you? How important is DEI integration to you? I should make that survey longer. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's part of a longer survey with other background information stuff, but no, I don't ask about those more detailed follow-up questions, but that's a good I'd idea be, to ask. I'd yeah. be so curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just because from like some of the data I kind of get yeah. exposed to through interdisciplinary work I do with theologians. They talk all the time about the rise of the nuns and how like increasingly folks are not identifying with any specific religious category, mm. but they're identifying as none. And when you start to delve into kind of the why behind mm -hmm. that, a lot of what they're pinpointing is that folks just don't feel like the church is speaking into like the issues of our day or that they aren't leading the charge on social justice issues. And so that kind of hypocrisy piece, I think comes out a lot. And so I would just, I would hypothesize, I don't know if this is true, but that as folks are saying faith integration is less important, they might be saying social justice integration is yeah. increasingly more important. Right. And so where you can like 
hook <laughs> hook them yeah. on that, yeah. right? Like the social integration piece is not to be separated in a lot of ways from the faith piece. If we're living our faith well, mm -hmm. I think that we can't ignore that social justice piece of it. And so I think a lot of that maybe is indicative of the fact that folks have felt like those two things are polarized as well, that faith is over here and social justice is over here. And to whatever extent you can, or we can all show them like those two things are actually really tightly intertwined when we're living out our faith the most yeah. authentically. Yeah. And when we're modeling our lives after the life that Jesus lived, then I think maybe they would start to say, oh, okay, faith integration is more important mm -hmm. if I yeah. can see that actually it's informing the why right. behind the social justice piece. Right. That's well put. I also wonder if I get students who are sort of coming at it from a different perspective where they hold their Christian faith very dear to their hearts. And then they think that, oh, like social justice efforts or DEI efforts are against my Christian faith, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore they're responding in that sense on that survey, yeah. meaning like they don't want this non-Christian kind of suspicious thing in mm -hmm. sort of integrated with their faith perspective, which is much more sacred to them, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. And yeah. definitely I think models the polarization we see kind of more broadly yeah. in our nation. And so as we see that polarization like a microcosm of that at SPU, mm -hmm. I can imagine you do get a lot of both folks yeah. that are saying, I don't, I don't want to start to, to yeah. water down my faith with mm -hmm. the science yeah. or with the social justice piece or what have yeah. you. And mm -hmm. other folks that are saying like, I just, I don't have the time for that because it right. seems so disconnected. Yeah. 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 You said the word disconnected and I'm curious how you connect these sometimes seemingly disparate pieces like DEI, faith, and psychological research. Do you have an example of an assignment or lecture that you do in Gen Psych that illustrates how you bring those pieces together? Yeah, I, I love this question because it's something I think about so much in my own scholarship right now. Mm -hmm. And so I've been working with my undergraduate mm -hmm. students, I'm always working with undergraduate students in yeah. my research. And one of my undergraduates, Amy Funabashi, and mm -hmm. I recently published a paper looking at faith in action question mark. And how do people's like public and private religiosity predict yeah. whether they think that faith informs their social justice actions and then whether or not faith actually informs their social justice actions. And so I was trying to get a little bit at that disconnect of like, I, as a Christian and I read the Bible and I see how Jesus stood up for the marginalized mm -hmm. and the disenfranchised and how he was always speaking truth to power. And I see those things, I believe them. And I want to believe that those things are imprinted on my heart. And then I'm trying to do the same. And so it might be that I feel like, yeah, like I think about social justice largely in ways that are shaped by my faith, but where do my feet and hands hit the ground in terms mm -hmm. of how I'm living that out, how much time I'm spending mm. engaging with social justice efforts. And mm. in theory, if faith really informs social justice in a positive way, then the stronger my mm -hmm. faith, the more I should be engaging yeah. in social justice efforts. And so, you know, we kind of break down in the paper that there is a really strong connection between the strength of someone's faith and the extent to which they believe that their faith informs their social justice engagement. But there isn't a connection between the strength of someone's faith and the extent to which they actually engage in social justice efforts, particularly for folks who identify as white. And so when we see people of color mm -hmm. answering these same questions, some of those relationships get stronger in terms of the connections between one's faith and one's actual social justice engagement. And so this is where my head is all the time thinking about how, how can we call out the church on what it's doing well? How can we yeah. call out the church on what it's not doing well and amplify what's going well and the values that are really important and also bring awareness to where there are those disconnects. And so I have my students in Gen Psych actually read this paper and reflect on it. And so this has been, I guess, over the last year, a new assignment that I've been able to kind of bring in and say, here's a way that we can start thinking about 
our faith and yeah. our social justice as it pertains to a psychological research methods approach, but also mm. other topics in psychology that we care about. And students have to try to summarize the paper, which is a big task for our gen psych students because they haven't had a lot of exposure reading research articles like this, but they also get to reflect a little bit on their own kind of connection between mm. faith and how they believe it informs their ideas about social justice and then faith and how it actually connects to the extent to which they spend time engaging with or thinking about social justice issues. So that's one of the kind of newer assignments that I've recently integrated, but I think there's lots of really fantastic research that you could do something similar with, right? Mm -hmm. Where you could start to say, let's think about how these religious variables or these spiritual variables are related to DEI and do some kind of personal reflection on that. And then it opens up some space for folks too, who say, I don't subscribe to a faith. Like these two things are, they're unrelated for me or to reflect on their racial identities and how racial identity might be a key piece of that connection. And maybe thinking through different theological traditions mm -hmm. that folks of different races and ethnicities might be more familiar with or more exposed to and how those different theological traditions like a black liberation theology is so deeply tied to social justice efforts and the lived experiences of folks with marginalized backgrounds that those two things physically cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. And so I think it also helps to bring hopefully some awareness and time for white folks to sit with yeah. that question mm -hmm. for their self too. Mm. That's really impressive that you have your Gen Psych students reading your <laughs> peer reviewed article and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and also reflecting on these really important and relevant questions. I wonder because you did find the difference in terms of the white students' experiences versus the students of color or participants of color. Um, mm -hmm. When students read that particular finding, are they receptive to why that might be or the fact that it is that way? In the reflections that I've read so far, students seem really reflective or receptive rather to that finding. And I think a big piece of that is who our students are at SPU. I taught at a Christian institution before I was here, and I can imagine at that Christian institution that the responses or reactions would be quite a lot different. Mm -hmm. It was a, a more conservative setting where even talking about evolution was like enough for me to be like labeled as a heathen in my student feedback forms. So there's, I think, a religious piece of this. I think there's a political piece of this being situated in Seattle. I also think that there is a racial piece of this because my gen psych students are now less than 50% white. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of folks, this feels like being seen in a lot of ways for folks that really strongly identify with a faith that has always cultivated yeah. a really deep understanding of mm -hmm. like what faith means to folks who have been marginalized and where there is good news in that, but also where there is a lot of work to be done in that. And so I haven't gotten a lot of pushback on that assignment, which there's always space for that. I mean, the, the student evals are not in yet from this quarter, but so far, I think students have been pretty receptive. And I think it introduces, like you were saying, many avenues for deeper conversations, right? Like mm -hmm. what are the potential moderators or the mediators mm -hmm. that can explain that relationship, that difference between the white students and the non-white students. And also topics like performative allyship might be mm -hmm. something that can connect to finding like that as well. So yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I think it's one of the things that's like on top of my mind right now. It's actually related to what we were just doing in ARM, looking at intrinsic and extrinsic motivators for social justice engagement. And that idea of performative allyship really closely connecting to extrinsic motivators for social justice engagement. And so a lot of what my work in dehumanization is showing is that you really do need to cultivate the sense of social justice importance, which is more closely tied to an intrinsic motivation, which then I think and hope, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done in this to kind of tease mm -hmm. them apart, but it seems like those could be separated from the performative allyship pieces. And what's been so fascinating to me 
sorry, just to talk about all this no, just, research right now. But yeah. what's been so fascinating to me is that folks are always talking about changing attitudes, changing mm-hmm. attitudes, changing attitudes. And mm-hmm. I mean, if you're in any DEI workshop, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about implicit attitudes, first of all, and, you know, a lot of times not even the explicit attitudes, which mm-hmm. are also shaping a lot of behaviors a lot of the mm-hmm. time. But what this work is suggesting is that attitudes don't really matter all that much until people care about social justice issues. Mm. And so when you look at how folks are going to treat or try to intentionally avoid individuals experiencing homelessness, Mm. if they have strong social justice importance, then dehumanization predicts their avoidance. But if they do not have strong social justice importance, they could dehumanize them, they could not, and it doesn't predict their avoidance. And so it's really interesting to kind of see, I mean, you know this very well, like there are a lot of disconnects between attitudes and behaviors, and there's lots of ways that attitudes may or may not manifest in different behaviors. But to me, there seems like this common thread of like social justice importance or this intrinsic, very much not the performative allyship piece that is going to say that needs to be in place before changing your attitudes is even going to like make a difference at all. And so once we get people to see that social justice matters and they adopt that as like a personal belief for themselves, then if you improve their attitudes, that might start to impact their behavior. And so it's a really complicated story, I Mm -hmm. think, but it's an interesting one because so much effort is going into changing people's attitudes and to see people be apathetic towards individuals experiencing homelessness, even if they think of them as fully human is signaling to me, a lot of our time is being spent on maybe some of the wrong (laughs) questions or the the wrong attitudes anyways. Yeah. That there might be a deeper or a variable that contributes more to the variance than just saying you should have more positive attitudes towards X group of people. Right. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you think about it, then like we all can act really pro-socially towards folks we don't have positive attitudes towards. Like a lot of us have to do that all the time in our work settings and in like our all sorts of environments. And so that disconnect, I think, is really important to consider. And sometimes we need people to be acting in the best interest of folks outside of themselves, kind of no matter what they think about folks. And then hopefully at the end of the day, we can improve both of those things, right? Like the goal is not to keep attitudes the same, but it's to say maybe there's a way we could get quicker to some of the outcomes we're hoping for. Mm -hmm. And then the more equity there is and the more exchange in those spaces there is, hopefully the attitudes are going to change with that, which is going to be the most sustainable way to change attitudes anyways. So it makes me excited to talk about this stuff. I think there's a lot in it. And I think it's something that maybe extends beyond one particular marginalized group. And so if you're cultivating social justice importance, yeah, which I think Jesus did so well, and it wasn't ever just about one particular group of people. It was about whoever was marginalized, like whoever was most like downcast or downtrodden, that sense of equity and social justice importance that might transcend attitudes across lots of different groups. So yeah. And we might even connect that to like character formation, right? Where mm-hmm. character formation is not about saying, oh, you should treat this group of people better, right? But it's about just in general, right? Being more attuned mm-hmm. to the needs of those who are marginalized or yeah. oppressed in our society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow, I, I think I can go on <laughs> about this, but I also wanted to ask this question because I struggled with it when I taught Gen Psych, and that is, mm-hmm. like, if you took an average Gen Psych textbook and flipped through it, mm-hmm. especially the chapter that talks about the systems and history of psychology, it's full of white men, right? European and European American men. Yep. And I'm curious how you then intentionally point out the fact that. On one hand, this might be the history, but on the other hand, psychology is so different now. But I mean, there's still a long ways to go, but psychology should serve all people, not just within the U.S., but around the world. And so how are you intentional in a class like Gen Psych, where Mm. students are presented with maybe more global and diverse perspectives? Yeah, this is such a good question. And this is one in particular I'd love to hear your Mm. insights on too, because I know you've taught Gen Psych and also just coming from your background and expertise with cross-cultural psychology, I'm sure 
the connections are really clear to you, maybe even in ways that they aren't to me. But probably, <laughs> I don't know if I should admit this out loud, but the truth is that I, I do a, a very, what we call a brief overview of psychology that is about yeah. 30 minutes of history and systems on the first day of class, yeah. mm -hmm. where we show the photos of all the old white guys. And I say, this is a bunch of old white guys. And this is what psychology looked like for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And that's problematic for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. And here's the direction I think psychology is going. And I show students a QR code that they can scan with their phones and it takes them to the rising stars, the psychological science rising stars page. And if you're not familiar, it's like all these young scientists, all these young psychologists who are winning awards for being really like groundbreaking in their fields. They're making really great contributions. And so within the first 30 minutes of my Gen Psych class, they are identifying someone who they mm -hmm. identify with mm -hmm. on any sort of like identity variable that they find meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And they are doing a little bit of like Googling to figure yeah. out what does this person do? Mm -hmm. What are their contributions to their field? How do they identify? And so I try to set the stage really early on that psychology is changing for the better without ignoring the fact that still a lot of the foundation of what is in those textbooks comes from a very biased kind of one dimensional perspective. And so the other thing that kind of gets set up early on in that class, which this is not like me, this is in the textbooks themselves, but it's the, it's the biopsychosocial approach, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's this kind of three pronged approach mm -hmm. to any mental process or behavior that we need to understand somebody's biological influences, their psychological influences, and their social cultural influences. And where I see kind of the weakest representation is those social cultural influences. And so often that's what we're doing in classes like activities is trying to explore social cultural influences that shape some of these phenomena. Right. And so I hope that it comes across clearly, at least like in the framing for my students that I want to acknowledge this is where we've been. This yeah. makes the generalizability of what we're talking about limited. And we should always be critical and challenging, like who are our participants? Like what was the line of thought? I mean, in a lot of ways, I was thinking about this earlier, you can't really separate faith from psychology either because Christian faith has shaped a lot of the the assumptions that have been yeah. made in psychology because Christian faith has been integrated with a lot of the white men in power who contributed a lot of what we know or knew early on about psychology. And so I think that critical thinking piece that we're all trying to establish with our students about the hidden assumptions and biases, who is here, who isn't here, all of that's really valuable to talk about, but it it is... A, <sighs> It's always a space I'm trying to grow in. And it's always something I'm wrestling with because a lot of those examples don't come up naturally in the mm -hmm. textbooks themselves. Mm -hmm. It's all a lot of like adding to, which is really important and valuable. And I think there's unlimited space for that to be done better. It's something I wrestle with a lot. And one other just kind of concrete example in case this is helpful for somebody, but I do try to tell some stories related to like, different cross-cultural or social psychological perspectives and how culture can shape phenomenon that we maybe took for granted as being like universal. And so there are a lot of really great examples in this space. Thankfully now, mm -hmm. like where we're teaching, like we can appeal to that if you're willing to be, I think, intentional about pulling those in. And one of my favorite kind of stories that isn't in the textbooks is actually just talking about I had a mentor at Dartmouth, her name was Talia Wheatley, and she did a lot of research on where we detect life in a face. And so they have these really creepy images where they've morphed a doll face with a human face. And so like on the far end of the spectrum, it's 100% doll. On the other end of the spectrum, it's 100% human. And every iteration in between is some combination of that. Wow. And you can get to that like tipping point of like 50% mm -hmm. doll, 50% human. And they're always playing around with like, where do we think that it becomes alive? And so they had established some sort of kind of tipping point in like a white Western sample. Mm. And they wanted to take this question outside of like the white Western context and they weren't going to have computer access. So Talia had printed out all of these images and they got to like a rural tribe in Cambodia and they set down the polar opposites, like the face that's the doll and the face that's the human. And just like to check things, we're going to like go, okay. They were like, which one's alive, which one isn't. 
And the folks reversed the images, thinking that the doll looked more alive and the human looked less alive. And I've like this story, I mean, it's been like 10 years since Talia told me this, but just like really stuck with me as like this incredible assumption of like, even what we take for granted in terms of exposure and like what we consider like the norm and what we're comparing things to and just some of the assumptions that we're making. And so I hope that stories like that or like the Mueller liar illusion that works for folks in certain cultures, but not in other cultures help to break down even some of these like deep perceptual processes that I think oftentimes are thought to be or were initially thought to be kind of beyond the yeah. universal influence yeah. mm-hmm. of, of social cultural factors. Right. And so trying to pull early on these examples to say, even what we take like the most for granted in terms of our vision, our ability to identify something as alive or not alive is shaped by our exposure, it's shaped by our culture, it's shaped by all of these other pieces. Yeah. And so those stories, I think, can hopefully be illuminating for students too, just about how specific and narrow a yeah. lot of what we're learning about can really be but those um, are really great examples i'm like making mental notes so that i can also incorporate them in my teaching your point about some things that we tend to say oh that might be culture free or, or mm-hmm. universal i think that's a really important one that even in neuroscience i want to sort of grow my understanding of the how culture might impact neurological findings as well right i remember reading in grad school about studies that show like how like an interdependent view of oneself Mm -hmm. could actually kind of expand sort of one's conception of i as a person right and how Mm -hmm. that could impact what areas of the brain light up in terms of when the word I or things associated with I are shown, right? And how Mm -hmm. for one culture, the word mother might be very distinctive compared to I, but for other cultures, those two things might be infused and Mm -hmm. how the brain might respond in a similar way. So I I wanna grow in that area because my background is not in neuroscience, but to be able to give really compelling examples of even outside of what we typically consider sort of culture specific, right? There are universal Mm. or what we consider universal things that may not be universal. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And getting into questions of like how the self is defined, I think across culture is so fascinating. It also reminds me of, there's a lot of really great work on time perception and how we language time and how we think about time and folks who are bilingual being able to have like two timelines, like yeah. a, mm-hmm. you know, a vertical timeline and a horizontal timeline. And I think one that really was so fascinating for me to learn about, just because again, like we're so grounded in our own perspectives yeah. is like the metaphors we use to think about the future mm-hmm. in like a white Western culture will often be that like the future is in, in front of us and the past is behind us. And in other cultures, it's reversed where the future is behind you and the past is in front of you because what is in front of you is what has been known. It's like what can be seen and the future is behind you because you don't know what it is. It's like unknown to you. And so even just like the metaphors and the way those shape the way that we think about these abstract concepts like time or the self or things like that. It's, I think it's really fascinating work. And that's the thing that's so sad about the fact that psychology textbooks don't do a good job of integrating all of this, mm-hmm. because I think anytime you have those experiences or you can help students have those experiences of just like, like glass shattering light bulbs, like flickering, like, oh my gosh, this is the way I'd always seen the world. And I took for granted that I thought that everybody saw it the same way. And I had never even considered the opposite. We do the whole black and blue, white and gold dress charade and gen psych. And Mm. I do it just to like start frustrating my students from day one of like, you're taking your own perception for granted. And you have this illusion that the way you see the world is the way that everybody else sees the world. And that's not true on these most basic visual levels. And can you imagine how much more not true that is on some of these more complex, like interpersonal levels, dynamics between folks. And so I think students really hate that (laughs) because it pushes them, but Mm -hmm. they walk away talking about that stuff. And it's what comes Mm -hmm. up over and over again, you know, in my feedback as Mm -hmm. well as the times where 
I mean, the whole idea is perception is constructed and it's constructed by those biological, psychological, and social cultural influences. And if they walk out of my gen sci class with one thing, it is hopefully yeah. <laughs> that. Like, I understand that my perception of the world is not an accurate reflection of reality. It is a construction of all of these different pieces of like who I am and the environment I was raised in. And I think that's really valuable for lots of reasons, but I hopefully hope it helps us all to establish some level of humility as well, just when it comes to having a hard time understanding how people have different experiences than we do or why two people can think totally differently about the Mm -hmm. exact same thing. Yeah. No, I, I love all of what you've shared. Another thing I try to do, which is not as deep or sophisticated as what you shared, Brittany, is I just try to be intentional about the images and the videos that I use in class, especially in Gen Psych, because it's easy to use what's available, which is disproportionately, again, a certain group, right? And therefore, yeah. to be able to find images and videos and, like you said, examples that are more diverse, more global, I think is something that I've tried to do. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I think just piggybacking off of that, Mm -hmm. Paul, students see that and they don't take it for granted either. Mm -hmm. I'm really intentional about like when we talk about pro-social behavior and social psych, every example of pro-social behavior I give is of a minority individual acting in a very like altruistic and pro-social way. And students without making it a big deal, I don't name it. I just give those examples And students will pick up on that weeks later in a student feedback form to say, like, it meant a lot to me that you were talking about, like, a Black woman engaging in this level of, like, altruism or pro-social behavior. And, like, I saw that. And so I think it's easy when you're throwing together your PowerPoints and you're, like, you know, it's 2 a.m. and you have a lecture to give and you're building all this for the first time Mm -hmm. to just default to what feels easy. But I do think it really resonates with students and it's really powerful to help them feel seen. Sure. I also wonder if like some of the AI image generating spaces are going to help make some of that more accessible for us in lots of ways. Cause you know, there's all these copyright things and can take a lot of time <laughs> to find the right images. And there's, I don't know, maybe some potential in that to create some more kind of visibility that's above the copyright restrictions. Yeah. Good point. Another thing for me that I've sort of unintentionally found helpful is when I, as someone who sometimes mixes up different cultural metaphors or Mm. (laughs) different sayings, I sometimes assume my students know a particular saying, like the arm bends inward, for example, right? Which is a very popular Korean saying, but then I get a blank look and then it's an opportunity for me to actually use that to sort of present a non-Western perspective, right? And mm, so yeah. I found that sometimes I've unintentionally stumbled into these moments where I can mm. say, oh, I just assumed that you knew this, but this is how we use this phrase in my cultural background. So that's that's been helpful for me too. Yeah, and so valuable for the students to see that. And just to have that kind of moment of awareness of like translating those things across different cultural dialogues. It, is a lot of extra effort and also I think really valuable for them to see. It reminds me, I don't know why it reminds me of, but it just popped into my head a time that I've done this really poorly, which was some of the psych exams that I had built like early on, like my first couple of years here. And prototypes is something that comes up in gen psych, one of the chapters, the cognition chapter, I think it is, which is like our best mental representation of a category. Mm -hmm. And this is wildly socially and culturally dependent, right? Like Mm -hmm. what you think of as like a prototypical fruit is like wildly different if you grow up in like the United States versus Mm -hmm. Thailand Mm -hmm. but in my own cultural like blind spots had Mm -hmm. presented a question to my students about like a prototypical sport like which is not essentially prototypical and then after the fact realized that this is so biased to have someone assume Mm -hmm. or to make the assumption rather that like all of my students are from like a Western context and not even just Western, but like a United States context where soccer is not, but football is a better example of like a prototype. And so things like that have also, I think been really good learning experiences Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. me of like, 
you know, you're talking about being able to kind of connect the, the dots for folks across different cultures. And you have this really rich experience that you can bring into your classroom as a teacher in that I think sometimes because I was born and raised in the States, I have more blind spots in terms of not thinking about who is my audience. And I will take for granted that like a Western saying that I am communicating is going to land with everybody. And I don't think about unpacking that for folks. And I have quite a few international students Mm -hmm. or quite a few students who like English is their second language. And Mm -hmm. they, you know, they grew up speaking Spanish and I still have a lot of room to grow in the ways that I'm kind of languaging and translating and communicating and not taking for granted anything, like whether it's like a Korean saying that you're mm-hmm. like taking for granted that somebody else is like hearing or a Western saying and realizing that that's a bi-directional kind of gap I'm trying to, to fill when trying to teach. And so exam questions have been something that I, I've worked with a lot, I mm-hmm. think, because a lot of my biases and assumptions and examples come out that way. And there's a kind of question about being able to bring other examples in like authentically without trying to like appropriate somebody else's culture without trying to like speak beyond my knowledge base, but also be representative of the folks that are in my classroom. So I think the point you made about where you can let folks speak for themselves, like where I can bring in videos of like black Americans talking about their own experiences with depression or Asian Americans talking about their own experiences, like with help seeking those types of things are really valuable too. So you take the pressure off of yourself to say like, I don't have to pretend to be an expert in all of these things. And I don't have to represent all these voices. And actually I probably shouldn't be always trying to represent them all in my own language, but pointing people in other directions. Yeah, that's really good. I know we, we talked a lot about teaching. We could talk more, but I also wanted to briefly talk about our collaboration because We've collaborated on a few different projects. I wish we could do more, right? Because I thoroughly enjoyed that experience. But I know that you've published quite a bit recently on, for example, anti-Asian racism during the COVID-19 pandemic. You helped draft the School of Psychology, Family and Communities DEI committee statement on anti-Asian racism during the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can support our students. You talked about your publication with Amy on social activism, right? And also you published recently on studies that had primarily Black American samples, right? And so, again, all that to say, really impressive work that's in the area of DEI. I'm curious if you feel comfortable sharing about sort of your personal motivation in doing this kind of work, especially... For example, collecting data with a sample that you're not from that culture, right? What kinds of thoughts went into that and how did you navigate those areas? Yeah, thanks for asking. This is a really interesting question because it isn't my background or my area of, of expertise even. My degree is in experimental psychology. I actually had a focus on social cognition and social cognitive neuroscience, but really didn't focus exclusively on any particular marginalized population Mm -hmm. or even like health and human flourishing variables. To be honest, I think a lot of that has kind of been a, a slow build in my own interests as I've been steeped in like the theology at SPU and one that I I'm so thankful I've had the opportunity to be more deeply exposed to. Mm. And just the more I feel convicted that I can't separate faith from social justice, Mm -hmm. the more important I feel it is to be kind of speaking into that where it makes sense or where I can be speaking into that. I think I've always been like social justice oriented in ways that I wouldn't have languaged it like that, but it's always been like a part of like who I was as a person, I think, but I grew up in like one of the whitest places in America with very little exposure to diversity of any sort, like Mm. faith diversity, race diversity. I mean, it was, it was a very homogenous culture and you don't see it until you see the contrast. Mm. I, I didn't have an awareness of how many blind spots I had in my, my faith perspectives or even my understanding of social justice until I started to kind of move around and get exposure to other ideas, other places, other thoughts, other people 
And so I think it was like growing on my heart as something that was becoming increasingly something I, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but for lack of a better way of thinking of it right now, something I couldn't ignore. Like if I was going to call myself a Christian and if I was going to continue walking this road of my faith, like I needed to start thinking about a lot of this in ways that were more intentional and less like I'm waiting for somebody else to educate me and more I'm taking the reins to try to educate myself. And a lot of that credit, I mean, comes from the conversations I've had with my students. I started at SPU at an interesting time because my very first year here was the year that Donald Trump won the election. Mm. And I had very, very poorly timed my first or one of my gen psych exams to the day after the election. And I just putting the schedule together, it wasn't even on my radar. And then I had students that I was sitting with who were just crying through their like entire exam. And I was just like, oh, this was such a, like such an oversight on my part. And so it's really conversations around social justice issues have really been, I think, a part of my work during like, or at SPU from day one. And then that continued to increase as as we saw like the increase in anti-Asian violence during the pandemic. And with my students just sharing some of their stories with me and some of them who would really bravely share them in class, others who felt less comfortable sharing them in class, but still really bravely came to share them with me. And I think in this, my approach was a little bit selfish because I just felt kind of helpless. Like I didn't know what to do in those moments. And I know enough to know not to make assumptions that other people would want what I would want in that moment, but I didn't know enough to know more than that. And so I think questions in like the hallway and conversations in the hallway with you and some of our other colleagues were really helpful for me because I was just struggling with like, how openly do I address this? Coming to terms with my own privilege as like a white woman, but also as a professor and like the ways that we have these platforms to be speaking into situations or to be ignoring them. And what message does that send as well? And so my heart was to be openly addressing Hmm. the anti-Asian violence that we were seeing and to name it and to be speaking about it. But I also didn't want to assume that that was going to be not Mm re-traumatizing for students who identify as Asian, who are already struggling. Like, yes, we know, we are aware that this is happening. And so I think that's where my question kind of started some conversations and other conversations were already happening. I'm just wanting to know how can professors show up? Like, how can we, as people that do have some level of kind of power in this platform in our environments, faithfully I don't know, see and support our students. And Mm -hmm. does that look like openly addressing a lot of the anti-Asian violence that's heightened right now without trying to ignore that this has always been an issue? Or does that look like doing that on maybe less public or in less public ways? And I'm a research scientist. So I'm like, well, (laughs) I guess that's a question we can answer like empirically. And it wouldn't have been a question I felt comfortable wading into on my own. I don't think, well, actually I know I I wouldn't have run or even attempted to run one of those studies by myself. Like Mm. I'm so thankful for you and Joel Mm. and Keeney and Dana, Mm. and just, it was a collaborative Mm -hmm. effort. And a lot of the variables actually that we collected are variables that other folks are much well-versed in than I am myself. I kind of took the lead, I guess, on managing the project in some ways, but just because I think I had the bandwidth to do it in some way that like I felt maybe others didn't because of how those experiences were landing differently on folks based on our different identities. But I felt like it was really important. And I Mm -hmm. felt like it was really important in our context at SPU because we haven't always done and continue to not always do a great job of naming Mm -hmm. like racial violence or naming religious violence towards marginalized groups of people. And so I, that was a really long-winded answer. I don't, and I don't even know if it was <laughs> concise enough to answer your question, but it for was. me, mm-hmm. yeah, it, collaboration is really important. Like I wouldn't be pursuing those types of questions on my own because I yeah. think my perspective is too biased. The work that we've done looking at our Black students' experiences 
was kind of a follow on in some ways conceptually uh, from what we did looking at our Asian American students experiences on campus and how, you know, whether or not leaders verbally language messages mm-hmm. of support, how that was associated with their mental health and well-being. We just to be totally transparent, did not find similar relationships for our black students. Mm-hmm. But what was very clear in the data that we did collect was that black identifying and biracial black identifying students were experiencing really different race-based trauma system symptoms from one another, but then also from individuals who identified as white. And so it seemed like that wasn't our primary question, but it was something that we saw in the data and thought, this is still an important story to tell. And again, I don't feel comfortable telling it on my own. And so I had written a grant through SPU, an internal grant to get funding yeah. to pay students to yeah. be research assistants. And so I have two black students who co-published that paper with me and also were you know, financially compensated for the work that they did and were really instrumental in shaping the narrative of that paper. And took the lead on it in a lot of ways. And so I, I I don't know if this is the right way to approach it or not, but for me, I felt like if black students aren't benefiting from this work at all levels, then it's not my story to tell. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But any insight you have, I mean, I know you do lots of this work and you do a lot of collaborations and you've been so gracious to be collaborating with and, you know, just talking me through a lot of these experiences, I couldn't even begin to pretend that like our conversations haven't been a huge piece of what has shaped me. (laughs) I'm going to expose myself to you in a way that I didn't intend to, but I remember a conversation you and I had maybe the very first year I was here, maybe the second year, it was early on and we were getting ready to go to Japan and we were taking our eight month old to Japan. And so it, it was like a pretty kind of big, ambitious trip in a lot of ways. But in just like your very kind, very gentle way, you had asked like if any if any of us spoke any Japanese. And I, at first I was a little thrown by the question because I just, I, I've taken that for granted a lot that I can travel broadly and speak English and make it work. And I, I love traveling and I don't speak any second languages. And that's been a question that is always in the back of my head. And I'm so thankful that you brought it up and that you did it in the way that you did. And it's just something that I think continues to like challenge me to think differently about like my own privilege and what I have been able to do and my my two white sons are going to be able to do because of, well, lots, lots of reasons, but because of the privilege that we have and how I can be aware of that, but then also lean into that in ways that I think are more faithful. And so I think I'm always, I try to always be listening and I'm really, really thankful for colleagues who Mm. are willing to talk and ask questions and share. And I think a lot of our research that we've gotten to do together, those collaborations, I've also seen them as like really learning opportunities for me. Like I'm, Mm. I'm trying to be here to learn and not to like control the narrative, but Mm. to say, this is a way that I can really lean in. And I think Mm. God engages us uniquely in lots of different ways. And for me, it's oftentimes through those questions, those research questions, and through the science, I think it's kept me invested in my faith. And I think it's kept me invested in DEI efforts in a lot of ways too, because that's just the way that my mind works. Like I always, I want to know the answer. And I believe that there are ways to start to get closer and closer and closer to that. Yeah. Wow. Brittany, there's so many good things there, but I really appreciate the intentionality and paying attention to students, both their input, but also the experiences of students who are from, for example, Black communities, right? And how on a particular paper, their insight would be especially helpful and maybe not just helpful, but critical, right? That you, you would want that input. And yeah. At the same time, seeing how you can make those contributions as well, like on our paper, papers, but especially the one on no cultural empathy, I truly appreciated that balance, right, between me being able to speak into the Asian American literature, but also you bringing in 
your training as a social psychologist and all these theories that I only had passing knowledge of, right? And so I think I look forward to hopefully more collaborations with you because it's just been really meaningful and enjoyable. And again, your student-centeredness really comes through. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we get to collaborate more too. And I think increasingly that level of collaboration is the answer to me to so many of these questions like about faith integration, DEI integration is like, we all have too many blind spots to go at this alone. And so like where there is really great faith integration, I think there's meaningful interdisciplinary collaboration where there's really good DEI integration. I also think there's really good, meaningful, like interdisciplinary collaboration. And it's so hard (laughs) to do that. Well, it's, it's time consuming. It also, it's, something that challenges and grows you as a person. And I think that's really important to be willing and ready to embrace, but I'm so proud of the collaborative work that I've done because I think it's exponentially better than anything that I could have put out myself and speaks hopefully more truthfully about, you know, people's experiences as well. And you're, you're doing it so exceptionally well across different topics, across different disciplines, right? And I hope to continue observing that and learn from you in terms of that collaborative work. And our students benefit from that so much as well, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Brittany. Thank you for listening to the Cross-Cultural Psych Podcast with Dr. Paul Youngman Kim. We hope this content was meaningful. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to write a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also, let us know what you'd like to see covered in future episodes. We hope you will join us next time.